Uh, backlogged handouts tonight because uh, that's how it is. So this is back from Apostolic Authority. If you're not taking one of these because you don't want one, you can just uh, give it back. I don't know, how many did you make? En enough for each of the candidates. Oh, enough for each of the candidates. If you're a sponsor, we don't really like you. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. sponsors. If you want a copy, then you should take pictures of it with your family. <laughs> I have multiple things I'm passing out. We also have the uh, the church tour and Sam's passing out church labels. Um, so when I taught last week, no one stopped me. So I'm going to blame all of you. Uh, I actually did this weekend's gospel last week. I don't know if any of you have been to church for this week. You're like, that has nothing to do with render under Caesar with a Caesar, uh, because I did last weekend's gospel passage, this weekend's gospel passage, last weekend. So we're going to skip the gospel passage, and we're going to go, I, what I would like to do is we're going to quickly review church tour. The sheet that Samantha just passed out is the sheet that I wanted to have last week that just has the words. Uh, let me hold this one up. This one, it looks like this. And you all, it, just at this point, it's the same thing here with pictures. So you can go through either one. I'm going to quickly scroll through these again. So you can go through the one that has pictures or go through the one that has just the names of the things. And if you want to put down like the use or what it's for, I'm just going to give like a real quick like review tour of, uh, of things that you saw last week if you weren't here. Last week, that's fine. Uh, this will be just a total something new for you then, and then we'll just uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go into this week's topic. So, an altar is a place of sacrifice. It's also a table because um, it is the Last Supper table, but it is, it is it's a place of sacrifice because it's where Christ allows us to enter in His His one sacrifice, which is the sacrifice for our salvation on Mount Calvary. Ambo is where we, we read the Word of God from, so where Scripture is proclaimed from. Presided as chair. Remember that word chair is a symbolic uh, image for us that has to do with leadership or head. Uh, the word cathedral comes from the Latin word cathedra, which means chair. Lavabo is for washing, the washing of the hands. Chalice, self explanatory. Chalice veil, self explanatory. Uh, Patent is the Latin word for plate, and there's two pictured here. One would be a would be a regular patent. The other one would be a communion patent with a stick on it. Corporal, Paul, and purificator. Corporal is the word for the that's the that's the, the the linen that's unfolded, and the body of Christ might fall upon it during the fragment rite, the the, the breaking of the bread. The pall is what covers. And the purificator is the napkin that wipes the chalice. This is just how the chalice is set up. Tabernacle, which would be the, uh, the house or the golden vessel that, that we put the blessed sacrament or the Eucharist in. Side altar or shrine, devotional candles, altar cross. Sanctuary and nave. The sanctuary is the place where the sacred action <coughs> takes place. The nave would be the body of the church. The baptismal font, oftentimes eight-sided, not required, but oftentimes eight-sided. Oh, baptistry, baptismal font where, where baptisms take place. Ambry is the holy oils that are used for the sacraments. We'll talk about the holy oils today. The Roman Missal is the book that the sacraments... The, 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 sorry, the, the Roman Missal is the book that the Holy Mass, all the texts for Holy Mass are found within the Roman Missal. Monstrance is from a Latin word, mostrare, which means to show. It's designed to put a host in. It's been consecrated, so the, the body of our Lord is placed in there for people to come and pray. A ciborium is 
is the container for bread that will be turned into the body of our Lord. Cruets are for water and wine. These are all the priest vestments. Altar candles. And last week we talked about 2, 4, and 6 for daily masses, feasts, and solemnities, and 7 for a bishop. Holy water fonts at the doors for a reminder of baptism. Reconciliation rooms and confessionals where people confess their sins. I just had a priest call me today. We were talking when I was eating dinner real quick. Um, he had someone come to confession today who had not been to confession for 85 years. They were 94 years old. And this person was like tremendously prepped and ready to go. They were like absolutely like totally serious about like coming to confession and being like, and he said it was just awesome. He's like, it made my week because he was having a really bad week. And he, he, he was calling me to let me know that like the week turned around and everything's okay. Here at the confession of someone who's been away from the church for a really, really long time. And he said it was just, it was just awesome. So I was like, that's why we're priests. Uh, actually, this was not in here last year. This is a last week. This is a thurible, which is uh, the incense. The boat is what has the incense that goes into the thurible uh, that burns. And then uh, these were not here last week. Either. These would be like chapel bells or the bells that are rung at mass during the consecration. And there you go. Okay, so that was our real quick review. Any questions on any of that? It was really fast, I know, but you guys are so smart. You guys are fantastic. Okay, so this is, uh, what? You're cutting off the top, it's right here. This is going to be very exciting because you can take notes on these pieces of paper. It'll be very exciting. So I actually have these done beforehand. <clears throat> And so when we use the word initiation, we're talking about sacraments of initiation. We use the word initiation sometimes when you're being initiated into a club or into a fraternity, uh, into some sort of uh, group of people. Uh, we're going to talk about how one is initiated into the church. It's threefold. <laughs> For one to be fully initiated into the church, there's baptism, confirmation, and Holy Eucharist. We're gonna, that, that's what today's class is going to be about. To be kind of an overview, I'm not going to get real, real in-depth, because we actually have follow-up classes, which will actually specifically be like the, the entire class will be like next week, I think the class is actually on just baptism. And baptism and confirmation. So like it'll just go more in-depth. But this is just kind of like, what do we mean by sacrament <clears throat> initiation? Many of you who are here are here because you're like, I want to be fully, fully initiated into the Catholic Church. So, how do you do that? Well, let's look at uh, a simple definition of initiation. Uh, the process of being formally accepted as a member of a group of an organization, the process of being initiated. Give me some names. Uh, have, have any of you been initiated in, in, in any organizations, clubs, or groups? Anybody? Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts. Yes, the Knights of Columbus. National Honor Society. Ah, National Honor Society. Who's the president of that <laughs> I ran with my best friend. He was the VP. And I was the, I was the president. I, we, we totally, I had the lowest grade point average. <laughs> so, I kid you not, I did. <clears throat> and we, we went for, a, we, 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 uh, we ran on the same ticket. We said that if you voted for him, you had to vote for me. If you voted for me, you had to vote. And we solely did it because we wanted to give the speeches at the, uh, at the, uh, yeah, at the initiation thing. So, anybody else? FFA. FFA. Okay, and there's normally like rights, and there's normally like actions, like even with the, the, the I know with the Knights of Columbus, with uh, National Honor Society, there's like candles that are being lit, people have things that they say, and it's all about you being brought into a pre existing group. So, how does one formally become accepted and become a member of? Christ's church, which is his body. A ceremony or a series of actions that makes a person a member of a group or an organization. Uh, the act of starting something, the beginning of something. So when we talk about initiation, like I could initiate uh, a fight. So it's also not just about just becoming a member, but it's also about 
when you receive the sacraments of initiation, it's also something is changing in you. Something new is happening in you. So it's not just me belonging, it's also the fact that I'm actually being changed. So, this definition, you're going to have this memorized, uh, whether you like it or not, because I, I, I'm going to go over this a thousand times like, throughout the rest of our classes, because this is very, very important. So when we talk about what is a sacrament, so we talk about the sacraments of initiation, the definition of a sacrament is really, really important. Every sacrament has some sort of outward sign. So we're gonna, for those of you who are Catholic and can rattle off the seven sacraments, what would be the outward sign or tangible symbol for the sacrament of baptism? Water. Water. Oils. Well, those are going to be non-essential, but we'll, we'll, we'll get into those. So all, all the sacraments have essentials, and then they also have like non-essentials which add to the right but are not essential. So for example, if I meet someone's on the side of the road and they're dying, I can baptize them and all I need is water. I don't need oils, I don't need a candle, I don't need a white garment, I don't need godparents. All I need is water. So the sacrament of, of baptism, sacrament of Holy Eucharist, what is the only two things that are necessary for the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist? Bread and wine. Sacrament of the anointing of the sick. What is the only thing that's necessary? The oil that I'm going to anoint the individual with. Uh, sacrament of holy matrimony. This is the, this is always my favorite one. It's actually not rings. Man, woman. This is, thank you. <laughs> Rachel's heard this a thousand times. Yeah, I give talks on this. She actually, she's been through my marriage prep. Part of my marriage prep talk is this joke that I did. Anyways, whatever. Anyways, so the only thing that's necessary for the sacrament of holy matrimony is a man and woman. Rings are not, <coughs> rings are not required. You don't, you don't need rings to be married. They would be, they would be, the, the church would see those just as much as the white garment or the anointing or the candle at a baptism. If you're poor, can you afford rings for a baptism? I mean, sorry, sorry. If you're poor, can you afford rings for a wedding? You can. Would the church withhold the grace of holy matrimony to somebody who can't afford rings? No. And in fact, let's say in some other culture, rings don't even symbolize marriage. For us, rings symbolize marriage, but we live in a really a Western Europeanized culture. In another culture, maybe a bracelet symbolizes the exchange of, of, of whatever. So, um, so, in every sacrament there is a outward tangible sign that is going to somehow bring about an inward grace. So, sacraments are outward signs <coughs> of inward grace instituted by Christ for our sanctification. So outward sign of an inward grace. I, I'm going to give you the definition of grace that I, that, that you can, there's all these great Greek words, hesed, and all the, for, for the word grace. I find the easiest way, and this will actually be helpful for a lot of you just by me saying this. If you take the word grace and just say the word grace is the life of God, The grace is the grace is the life of God. So if if I say the Hail Mary, Hail Mary full of grace. What is Mary full of? I just gave you the definition. The life of God. What did Mary at what is Mary at the moment of her conception receiving her womb? The life of God. She literally is full of the life of God. When we sing the song, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Amazing life of God that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind, but now I can see. 
So grace is, 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 is God's life freely given to us. If I'm having a great day and someone's like, how are you, Father? I might say, oh, I'm graced. The life of God is in me. Sometimes you will hear people who, uh, when we talk about sin, some people will say, I'm no longer in the state of grace. Or I've lost the state of grace. What they're saying is that they've committed a sin that they've deliberately chosen, and they're, and they're like, the life of God is, and we, we need to be careful how we say these things, God is always with us no matter what, but like, I've made a choice, and I've, I've, I've pushed Christ out of my life, and so I need to be reconciled to bring Christ deeper into my life. So the word grace is a great way to say, like, so we we receive the life of God. We receive God in His in His greatness, in His fullness. So sacraments are outward, tangible signs where that we somehow receive the life of God, and they're also instituted by Christ for our sanctification. The word sanctification, sancti, is the Latin word for holy, to make us holy. Sacraments are outward signs of an inward grace instituted by Christ for our sanctification to make us holy. So, baptism. Baptism is through water, brings us the life of God that makes us holy. Does that make sense? Bread and wine through the words of institution, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Their substance is changed to the flesh and blood of our Lord. When we receive them, we receive the life of God, and we're made holy. So, I often reduce this to a tangible sign or a symbol that's instituted by Christ, that's given to us by Christ in Scripture, that brings forth grace. A sign or a symbol instituted by Christ that brings forth grace. So, question. Why do we need the sacraments? I mean, like, God is all around us, right? God is all over the place. So, God can give grace to man without outward symbols, the sacraments, However, he has chosen to give life, his life, to man through visible signs. So, there was this guy in my last parish, uh, he was Catholic by name, never went to church, he was a local news reporter, and so I used to see him all the time, and uh, I remember one time he showed up at the church and whatever, and he was doing some sort of story, and I said, Bryce... I said, uh, just want to let you know, you're always welcome here at St. Mary's. And, uh, and he said, Father, he said, my church is a golf course on Sunday morning. I said, Bryce, that is fantastic. And I am so glad that you see God in nature. Genuinely. Because God is in nature. God is all around. I said, the only problem is that God didn't say, I'll save you on a golf course. But he did say, a lot about baptism, and a lot about the Eucharist, and a lot about the sacraments of the church. So, I'm thrilled that you're meeting God on the golf course, but know that God also has other ways that he wants you to meet him. I don't know if he's ever come back to church, but nonetheless. So, um, because God has done this, because God has says, because God did say, this is my body, this is my blood, because God did say, do this in memory of me. Because God did say, go therefore and baptize all nations. Because God did institute, he did initiate sacraments. Man would be foolish to, make, to not make use of, of this God-provided means of gaining, once again, sanctification, which would be to become holy, to become more like God, to become full of joy, to have God's life in us. So God's life is given to us in the sacraments, 
and thus it's a great thing for us to have. One of the great reasons why I love the sacraments is because of certitude and certainty. I love the sacraments because when I receive the sacraments, I know without a doubt that God is there because he said he would be there. And he said that he would meet us. He would, be, he would meet us there. So for example, I go to confession. So for those of you who don't know, priests have to go to confession to other priests. So I went to confession to an 84-year-old priest just earlier this week. Now, I know for a fact that I can ask God for forgiveness. I can. And God can forgive me. But then there's always like this thought of like, um, was I really forgiven? Was I really sincere? Did I really ask? Did I? And not to mention the fact that Christ has asked us to confess our sins to one another. But when I go to confession, there is that certitude of knowing that my sins are forgiven. I want to be close to Jesus all the time. But when I receive him in Holy Communion, I have certitude at that moment, knowing that God is there. There's this great sense of assurance and certitude that we find in the sacraments um, that Christ is truly with us in, a, in an amazing way. So, I like to look at the sacraments of initiation as really kind of the pattern of the human life. So, Baptism is to be born again. Confirmation is to grow in strength. And the Eucharist is how we grow in strength, which is by eating. Uh, none of us grow or can grow without eating. I mentioned last week that I'm reading uh, Killing England by Bill O'Reilly. I'm like, I genuinely have no idea. Like, I am the weakest man in the world. I have no idea how soldiers in the Revolutionary War survived. I really don't. The description of their life was like, they didn't eat, they didn't have food rations, they wrapped cloth around their feet because they didn't have shoes and washed through blizzards. Like, I am the wimpiest man in the whole entire world. But anyways, like, one of the grave concerns that General Washington had was that his men were not eating, and if they couldn't eat, they couldn't fight. Like, if we don't have food, we don't have strength. You can't grow if you aren't eating. So, baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist is how we, how we see a Christian fully initiated, because once they have those, they can then live the Christian life to the full. <coughs> For a young child, we, 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 we spread these out. So we give baptism to an infant. We give First Holy Communion to a young child when they reach their age of reason, which is around seven. We just want to believe that children can tell right from wrong. Um, some of you might be like, my husband still doesn't know right from wrong. Um, and then we normally give the sacrament of confirmation sometime when they read their teenage years. So that's sometime normally in our diocese we say around 13. So that's normally 8th grade or above. In our parish we normally do like freshman, sophomore year. So let's, uh, let's look at these sacraments. So, baptism. Baptism, of course, is the sacrament that we hold very um, beautifully in union with all Christians. So, in fact, we would actually say that you're not a Christian if your baptism is invalid. So, like, Mormons are not Christians. Because they don't believe in that baptism is the same thing that we do, and they actually don't believe that Jesus Christ is truly God. Jehovah, Je Jehovah's Witnesses are not bat are not Christians because they don't believe in the Trinity, and their baptism is not what we would believe baptism to be. However, outside of that, everybody else who proclaims baptism, we're like. We believe that your baptism is valid, and we believe that baptism is good. They not, may not believe that 
our baptism is valid. Some people don't believe that Catholic baptism is valid. Other Christian denominations. But we would believe that their baptism is valid. So let's look at what Scripture says about baptism. This is John chapter 3, verse 5. And men and men, I say to you, unless you're born of water and of the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That's pretty huge. That you can't enter into heaven unless you're baptized. Mark 16, 16. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. So, what does baptism do? I like to just look at the tangible element or symbol. So, what, what, what is tangibly needed for baptism? Water. What does water <laughs> naturally do? Two things. Hopefully all of you wash on a daily basis. It cleanses things, but the other thing that water does is it brings life. Nothing in our world can exist without water. Nothing. If you don't have water, you die. And in fact, how many days can you live without water? It's like right around seven. Which is actually a great, beautiful, uh, natural gift of why we should go to church once a week because we need to be renewed in the waters of Christ. So, just as water cleanses and brings life, so does baptism. It washes away sin, and the life that it brings, it brings, once again, it brings grace, which is the life of God, but it also makes us members of Christ's body, which is the church, which gives us life as well. Baptism also, we believe, leaves a mark this is going to get a little bit confusing. This will be go, gone into deeper. We believe that three sacraments, baptism, confirmation, and priesthood, literally, that a mark is put on your soul forever. So we believe that once you're baptized, you are always baptized. You can't, like, take baptism away. You can't get rid of your baptism. So once you are baptized, you are baptized for life. And your soul is marked. You are claimed for Christ at that moment, and that, that hold that God has on you never goes away. Indelible meaning that it can't go away. It's, it's forever. So, we uh, practice uh, infant baptism, which sometimes people struggle with a little bit. Uh, I think to like look at it biblically, so if you're a faithful Jew, and we have to remember that Christianity came directly out of Judaism, any faithful Jew who did not circumcise their child on the eighth day would be considered to be, should be cast off from the community. If you're a parent who doesn't circumcise your young boy on the eighth day, like, you aren't a Jew. The passing out of the faith from parent to child is essential. So early Christians automatically when their child when their children were born would baptize their children. Many of them baptized their children on the day that they were born because infant infant mortality was so rampant and they knew that baptism was quintessential for salvation so they baptized their children uh, often the day they were born uh, because they wanted to assure that that child would have the gift of eternal life. I always when I give baptismal homilies, I often tell parents about how baptism is the best gift you can give to your child. And it's a gift, which means that the person who receives the gift has a choice. So my grandma, uh, on my dad's side, every Christmas would give all of us kids a sweater. And for those of you uh, who are like in my age group, I had multiple sweaters that had those reindeer that went across them. I don't know if you remember them, but they were awesome. There was like a stripe that went like right across your chest. And there were like these reindeer that were like embroidered into the sweater. Yeah, I didn't wear them. Um, and that's the whole point that I'm getting at. I didn't, I received the gift, but I never used the gift. Now my mom would force me to use the gift. So whenever we would go up north, my grandma lived in a cottage, uh, my dad's parents had a cottage and anytime we would go up there my mom would like come and like look at our suitcases and our bags and everything that was in our suitcase and our bag had to be a gift from grandma 
because we were going to wear them and parade them around at Grandma's cottage so that she knew that we loved her. Okay? Parents give the gift of faith to their child with the reality that their child may reject that gift. But, parents give the gift because it's the best thing they can give to their child. Does the child need to unpack the gift? They do. Does that gift need to become their own? It does. But we give the gift, and God willing, the witness of us living that gift, will create within our children the desire to live that gift as well. It's a new birthday when we really talk about, like, <clears throat> when we believe about a salvation in heaven. So when a child is born, that is their birthday, but a baptism is really their birth into eternal life. That's the day that they will ultimately have the promise of eternal life. And really, it's, 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 it is a new birth. It's a new beginning and a new life. Um, it is part of the tradition of the church uh, that we've always baptized infants. That's why actually baptismal fonts are small. Because after the first few hundred years of the church, when the church was suppressed and, under, and underground, and Christianity became really kind of the norm, there were no adults really to baptize for the most part. Because the faith is just being passed on mainly through infants. There are, these are three scriptural passages, scripture passages about, uh, from the Acts of the Apostles and 1 Corinthians, um, about whole households being baptized and whole families being baptized in the early church as just one of those ways to, to look at uh, infant baptism in the church. So there are symbols of baptism. What is the, the, the only one that's actually technically needed? Water. White garments are great. Our Lady Sodality actually makes white garments in case someone doesn't have a white garment. And it's a little symbolic one. Candles. Oh, actually, so actually, real quick, because this is actually really important. So why? I was like, so I'm actually, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you the answer. Because no one ever gets it right. But just think in your head real quick. Why do we wear white on the day of our baptism? Don't answer the question. There is one reason it has everything to do with the Bible. Because every single time the Bible speaks about people in heaven, what color are they wearing? Why does the church want you to wear white on the day of your baptism? They are literally saying, put on the clothing of the people in heaven, because that's what you now are. By Because of your baptism... You actually now get to dress up like the people that you God willing one day want to be. Right now, all the parents in the world are asking their children, well, not all the parents in the world, many parents are like, what do you want to be for Halloween? And a lot of kids are going to say that they want to be like, some, they want to dress up like someone they want to be. They want to dress up like Batman or Spider-Man. They want to dress up like a famous football player. They want to dress up like a famous gymnastic person or a dancer or a rock star because they want to be them. Well, the church says you should dress up like someone you want to be. So dress up like a saint. Put on a white garment that's been washed in the blood of the Lamb. In fact... If you understand that, that will make that'll help us understand every single time the church asks us to all wear white. That is why they wear white on the day of their first communion. That's why you wear white on the day of your wedding. It has nothing to do with whether you're a virgin or not. It has to do with the fact that like marriage is a sacrament. And on that day you are living out your vocation and with the person next to you, you are making the choice to say as Christians that we are going to consecrate our life to God. Every time we celebrate Mass, the undergarment of the priest is white, the altar servers wear white, and that's all because of this right here. Because we're dressing up the part. There's actually a community out of Spain called the, it's, it's called the Neocatechumenate, but it's this, it's this religious movement, but it's, it's for lay people. 
But when they gather for mass, every single person puts on a white garment. So they all have, they, they kind of look like moo-moos. They're like these really big, like, white, I don't know, yeah, like a moo-moo. You guys all know what a moo-moo is? Like a, it's like a big, white, long sleeve. They all wear, well, it's like a, kind of like this, but it has a big collar on it. And they all wear them. It, like, when we were in the Holy Land, they were, uh, we ran to a group of them there. Uh, but for any time that they, 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 like, carry them in their purses or their backpacks or whatever, but, like, every time they have mass, they all put on a white mattress and Really trying to live out this past, this idea that, that we are called to be saints, that we are the saints, and when we celebrate the sacraments, whether it be the Mass, or like, we most beautifully manifest that. So, we're not there yet at All Saints. I think we'll kind of wait maybe for a few years before we all get out, break out the moon moves, but you know, for those of you who like to sew, you can start making yours. Uh, the candle, of course, is a symbol of the light of Christ. The anointing, the word Christ means the anointed one, the Messiah. So we anoint the individual. They get a new name because they have a new life. So um, when adults are baptized, they're given a new name uh, at baptism. And then um, they have godparents. Godparents are actually really kind of an interesting thing. Like when I was a little kid, I was under the understanding that the reason why I had godparents, like, from my earliest age, like, was the thought of, like, if my parents died tragically, I was going to go and live with my godparents. I don't know if any of you, like, were taught that, but that's, that's what I was taught, like, as a little kid. So, um, I actually, my godparents are awesome. My, uh, my godfather uh, lived with my dad after college. They were, like, roommates. And he escaped from Hungary during, uh, during communism and uh, escaped to America. And he has this, like, this great story. And, uh, just anyways, yeah. So they're just good family friends. And so he's my godfather. But he has, like, a really, really thick Hungarian accent. And uh, we used to go to their house all the time. And I was always a little scared of them. And they had no kids. And um, I always feared that if my parents died, like, I would be living in this house with no kids. And, like, my brothers and sisters would be shipped off to other homes where, like, their godparents were. And, like, I would just live with this man with this really thick uh, Hungarian accent. Um, that is not why we have godparents. If you've ever heard that, you can flush that down the toilet. Um, the whole reason why we have godparents, uh, theologically and historically, is because um, in the early church, early Christianity, when you chose to become a Christian, uh, your family often completely abandoned. So families were completely divided. A child would choose Christianity, and their parents would say, we can never talk to you again. And they would literally walk away from their children. Um, I actually have this great film, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of St. Barbara, but she's a, she's a, a Catholic saint. Uh, they made a film about her. I just watched it actually just last week. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a whole film about families that, because of their choice to become a Christian, like, get completely... It's a whole bunch of martyrdoms, uh, people being martyred for the faith because of their confession of Christianity. But so what would happen is that when people would be baptized, the church would provide for them a, f a family. They would say, "Oh, Chad, your parents have abandoned you because of your choice. We're going to provide for you, Cindy and Bob, who are now are going to become your parents." And they would literally like take on that role of helping raise him and keep him in the faith, raise him, but also literally oftentimes just care for him, take him into their home. That tradition continued because the church realized that there was actually something really beautiful about not just the mother and father being responsible for the child's faith, but others as well being a part of that. And so the custom of godparents uh, continues uh, in the church. So, what's necessary for baptism? Uh, number one, one who is unbaptized and willing to receive. Free will is, is huge. So, like, you can't force someone to receive the sacraments. If someone doesn't want to receive the sacraments, you can't force them on them. Now, you might ask a question about an infant. Prior to the age of seven, it is the parents who make the decision for the child, just like the parents make the decision about what child, what language they're going to teach them, whether they're going to feed them vegetables or not, whether they're going to let them play with certain kids or certain toys. Uh, up to that point, the parents make decisions 
Number one, one is who is willing to baptize and knows how. So notice how skinny this definition is. Or how broad it is, depending on how you want to look at it. Anyone can baptize. So, can a Jew baptize? Yes. Can an atheist baptize? Yes. So for any of you who are not baptized, and you want to be baptized, and that's why you're here, if you go home tonight, please, this is not going to happen. <laughs> you're driving home tonight, and your car turns over, and you're on the side of the road. And the first person who comes up is a Jew, which I don't know of any Jews in Dearborn County, but there are some somewhere. Um, a Jew comes up, and you have a bottle of water in the back seat. You can say, please baptize me. And the Jew's going to say, I don't know how. And you're going to say, I was just at class, and they taught me how. Take that water and pour it on my head and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you are baptized. Any of you can baptize? Yes, go ahead. Can you baptize yourself? No, you can't. That's the only... Just like I can't hear my own confession. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, three drops of water. I baptize children in the, in the, in the, in the NIC units. What, is, what does NIC unit stand for? Neonatal and, intensive what does it mean? Neonatal intensive care unit. Neonatal intensive care unit. So when I go, they provide me with everything. They have a sterilized eyedropper, they have sterilized water, and I, three drops of water, and the child is baptized. With the words, as well. Is immersion necessary? No. Is it awesome? Yes. It is awesome. But not necessary. Once again, let's put this in a historical context. You have a child, that child is about ready to die. It's the Middle Ages. You run to a church, and the baptismal font is in the back of the church, and the water in it is frozen. Submersion a child that's sick into frozen waters is not good. A 90-year-old man on a deathbed who has a conversion experience trying to lower a 90-year-old man into a, a submersion pool as he's dying is not a good idea. Is it the best image that we have of baptism? Yes. Is it necessary? No. For validity, for, 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 for validity it's not, but it is awesome. Uh, my last parish, we used to actually bring in a, a big, huge feeding trough. Uh, on Holy Saturday night, we would like dumb people. It was awesome. But anyways, okay. And then these words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, all of you should memorize this, and because you might need to use it someday in your life. Popes have written like encyclicals and letters to like nurses that they should all know this and be ready to baptize on the spot. Like Catholic nurses should always be ready to baptize. And a lot of Catholic nurses do baptize. Because sometimes you can't get a priest or a deacon to be there on the spot. But anyone can baptize. Second of the question about baptism real quick. Yes. Um, can a person be baptized after death? If like they just died, then the priest comes in? No. Too late. Okay. The, what, what we... No. The, yeah. If, let's say that... No. <laughs> so sacraments are for the living... Okay. <clears throat> However, I just want to like, so, with the anointing of the sick and absolution, the church is very lenient in the sense that, like we were taught in seminary, if the body is warm, <coughs> you celebrate the sacrament. Because we don't know, science doesn't really know, and it's been proven again and again and again that we don't know when death actually takes place, and what, what science believes is death is not God's belief in death. And there's many people who have who've been declared dead who have some sort of ability to come back 
to life than when they were already alive. And they know everything, they heard everything, and everything was... So, if the body is warm, we believe that you're still supposed to anoint or give absolution. Didn't you say there's three forms of baptism? There are three forms of baptism. We learned about this uh, at a recent funeral. So baptism by water, baptism by martyrdom, or baptism by desire. So if one desires baptism, and they, <laughs> they are intentionally desired to be baptized, but it just doesn't happen because of logistics, then we would treat that person at death as a baptized Christian. So let's say that you go to a hospital and you're talking to somebody and they're ready to die. And that person's like, I never got baptized, I wanted to be baptized. And you're like, well, I'm going to call Father Meyer and he's going to come and you're going to be baptized. Um, and I, I call, you call me, I'm on my way and the person dies. We would treat that person like a baptized Christian. And we would talk about them being a baptized Christian because they had the baptism of desire. Which we believe is just as real as real water baptism, as is baptism by martyrdom. So, other questions on baptism? This is there'll be more information on baptism next week. This is just kind of the get you started baptism. So, okay, confirmation. So, confirmation is where one receives the fullness of the Holy Spirit. So, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Holy, Most Holy Trinity. If you don't understand how the, how the Holy Trinity works, we're going to get there. Because uh, we do have a whole class on the Trinity. Um, huge to the sacrament of confirmation is the fact that the individual who receives is supposed to become a witness to the faith, which means that they are called to live the faith and to be seen as a disciple and follower of the Lord. And they're supposed to live their faith even to the point of dying, which means that if you receive the sacrament of confirmation, we believe that God gives them a the martyr's gift, the ability to, to live their faith even to the point of shedding their blood. So confirmation in the Bible, um, this is Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me, so confirmation is going to be about anointing. <coughs> to bring glad tidings of the poor, he sent me to bind up the broken heart and to proclaim the rated captives and to open me of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So this is said of Christ, and Christ says it's of himself. Fulfilling the prophet of Isaiah. But we also believe this is, this is what every every Christian is supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be living an anointed life. Um, in Jesus at Jesus' baptism, in those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the river, by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens open, the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. And a voice came, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. So with baptism, the Holy Spirit descending upon uh, God's beloved Son. In the Acts of the Apostles, now when the Apostles of Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the Word of God, they sent Peter to, and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for it had not yet been fallen to them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. So the Sacrament of Confirmation is where one receives the fullness of the Holy Spirit, and it happens through laying out of hands and the anointing. So here we go. Um, this is a bishop. <coughs> he gets to wear that cool hat. It's like the only cool thing about being a bishop. Uh, and here's this dude who's a baptized Christian. If he was from All Saints Parish, he would be wearing a white shirt and a red tie, by the way. Because we have dress codes. Um, but he is wearing a tie, so that's nice. And a blue shirt. So you need a baptized Christian. You need a bishop. Or a priest he designates. So I can celebrate the sacrament of confirmation when the bishop gives me permission. But a bishop is the proper celebrant to the sacrament of confirmation. Oil, which is sacred chrism. I didn't show you the holy oils when we were in the sacristy last week. And the laying out of hands. So the laying out of hands and oil are what's essential for the sacrament of confirmation. Uh, the oil, uh, okay, the oil is two things that it symbolizes. One, oil throughout uh, the, the biblical passages 
speaks of strength. It speaks of healing. But the third is it also is, is made reference to being a fuel. Like oil burns. And so we think of the early apostles, the twelve apostles. They received the fullness of the Holy Spirit when and where? Where did the, where, where did the apostles receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit? In the upper room on what feast day? At Pentecost. And how did the Holy Spirit come on Pentecost? Didn't he descend like how did, tongues of fire? Tongues of fire. That's why the bishop is wearing red. So the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles and fired like dropped down from heaven and let, rested on their foreheads. Thomas Aquinas uh, speaks about how um, one of the reasons why the sacrament of confirmation is conferred, given with oil on the foreheads is because oil burns and just like the apostles who had tongues of fire drop upon them, we have oil placed on our foreheads that literally can be set on fire to set us on fire for the gospel of Christ, that we might go out and preach the gospel of Christ. For any of you who have been to the St. Paul campus in New Alsis, they have an absolutely amazing image of the Holy Spirit above the altar there, and there's seven balls of fire that are like dropping down. It's very, very cool. Um, I had something to do with it. But not everything. I really didn't. People like give me way too much credit for that one. I put it up there, and it looked okay. But Janice Stonebreaker, who is an amazing artist, like made my work look really good. My mom used to do that. Like when I was like a little kid, I would like do my homework, and then my mom would like redo my homework. Like after I went to bed, and I would wake up in the morning, I'd be like, "Oh, that looks really good." And I put it in my book bag and get an A. And uh, <laughs> that's exactly what Janice Stonebreaker did. Uh, I'm three foot scaffolding. So. Question of the sacrament of confirmation? Yeah. Is that what symbol fire then for the sacrament of confirmation? Yes. Okay. So the Holy Spirit is normally symbolized by either fire or a dove. So St. Paul, you got both going on. You got fire and dove. A lot of Holy Spirit there. Yeah. Okay. Is that helpful? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Is the concept of receiving the Holy Spirit the same thing as being baptized in the Holy Spirit? No, different. So the sacrament of confirmation would be um, the ritual sacramental reception of, like baptism, an indelible mark that's on your soul forever, that can't ever be removed, given by a bishop or by a priest. When, when, <laughs> when we as Christians talk about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, we normally speak about more of like in the in in, in like a charismatic realm of one individual um, experience and um, religious response or reawakening. I think that would be like a, so. Our neighboring church, Saint Nicholas. Uh, in Sunman is uh, a very, very charismatic driven parish. So they often like, they offer uh, charismatic prayer services, charismatic praise and worship, um, charismatic uh, healing services. All, they're, they're, and sometimes we use the word charismatic, people think that you're, you aren't Catholic anymore. Very, very Catholic and authentically Catholic. Um, But a big focus for them, they, 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 they practice speaking of tongues and laying out of hands and, uh, and the acknowledgement and the, yeah, the, the desire for people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So it is part of our Catholic tradition. The sacrament of confirmation would be looked at as a sacramental ritual, which would be different than the individual personal experience of being baptized by the Holy Spirit. Does that help? Does that make sense? Yes. So is the baptism of the Holy Spirit something that is not given through a bishop or somebody? Correct. Okay. So the sacrament of, so through the reception of the sacrament, it, it might make the individual more open or receptive to being 
baptized with the Holy Spirit, baptized in the Holy Spirit, but that that experience itself would not be synonymous with the sacrament of confirmation. Um, we were told that one thing that stuck with me, being baptized is like becoming a citizen, being confirmed is like becoming a soldier for Christ. And that's why, you know, and I, I think that that's the image that was never taught to me when I was a kid, which drives me crazy. Yeah, so that whole understanding that, that the sacrament of confirmation gives one the ability to live their faith as a witness, even to the point of shedding their blood. So being a soldier, being a soldier for God, that I'm going to go out and live my faith and actually promote my faith and extend the kingdom of God. What does a soldier do? I mean, take out the violent part of like, I'm going to kill people. A soldier is about protecting the kingdom, advancing the kingdom, giving pride, glory, and honor to the kingdom. So when we see ourselves as nonviolent soldiers, what is my job? My job is to, to be, and, and be willing to risk my life for the kingdom. It's a beautiful image of, of, of Christianity. And in Ephesians chapter, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, it talks about putting on the armor of God. And it's this very powerful image, mili military image of what a Christian is, 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 is called to do in a very beautiful way. Any other questions about confirmation? Let me wash my time. Let's take a real short break. And because we have uh, desserts and coffee back there, so head on back and enjoy. Yeah. Talk about the Holy Eucharist very briefly, by the way. So, like, this is my favorite topic to talk about in the whole entire world, but we're gonna like contain ourselves within some sort of sanity. Um, when we talk about the sacraments of initiation, how because we're Christian, it is baptism, confirmation, and Holy Eucharist. It's normally the third sacrament that we give to children. It would normally be baptism, first reconciliation, and then uh, Holy Eucharist. So we believe that it is the body and blood of Jesus that it was given to us at the Last Supper. There's a beautiful picture here of uh, Jesus distributing Holy Communion. This is, I, I actually find some pictures to be ridiculous. So this is Jesus actually giving Holy Communion on the tongue to all of the apostles that are kneeling at the Holy Communion. Which is like, completely ridiculous, but like, whatever. There isn't even a table. It's so awesome. Um, it's a meal and a sacrifice. Once again, we'll get deeper into our theology, but we refer to an altar as a table and as an altar. So it is a meal, but it is also how we enter into the sacrifice of Christ's love given to us. It is his true and lasting presence. So... I think it was Tim last week when he asked, like, what do we mean by the word Eucharist? The word Eucharist actually means a lot of things. When we talk about the Eucharist, it's an action, it's an act of thanksgiving. But it is also when we talk about Christ being truly present. So, in Scripture, John chapter 6 is always the Scripture passage you can go to if you ever have any questions about the Eucharist. Uh, Jesus says, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. If anyone eats his bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. This word flesh here is sarks, which means literally like a hunk of meat. That he is going to give his flesh for the life of the world, that would be bread. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. They took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my, the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And the fact that he does this the night before he dies upon the cross, where he does offer his body and blood for the salvation of the world, is how he intends for us to enter into that sacrifice. So we are able to enter into the sacrifice of Christ on Mount Calvary, where he does... Literally on the cross, say, this is my body given up for you. This is my blood poured out for you. This is the blood of the new covenant. So these words up here in black literally are <clears throat> the nonverbal words that our Lord is speaking as he gives his body on the cross. In Acts chapter 2, 
we have the celebration of daily mass of the, of the apostles. Day by day, they went to the temple together. What, if we look at how the mass, I mean, we haven't gone to the mass yet, but like, if for, we've been to mass, many of you. The mass has kind of two main parts. You have the scripture liturgy of the word in the beginning where there's a first reading, a response to a psalm, a second reading, and an alleluia, and a gospel, and a homily, and petitions. That's why the apostles kept going to the temple. Because they were there to hear God's word preached. And to hear God's word proclaimed. But then they would go to their homes for what? The breaking of the bread. Which is the earliest way that Christians referred to the Holy Eucharist and to the celebration of Mass is the breaking of the bread. So you have even in the earliest days of the Apostles uh, this understanding of that they, they were doing a liturgy of the Word and a liturgy of the Eucharist. Acts 20.7 On the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them and he prolonged his speech until midnight. So if you ever think that my homilies are long, which they are, I get criticized by even my best priest friends, and uh, by my friends at Dynamic Catholic, uh, that my homilies are too long. So anyways. Um, <clears throat> when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long while until daybreak, and so departed. So what's necessary for the celebration of Holy Mass? Well, there does have to be an ordained priest. We do believe that for a valid celebration of the Holy Eucharist, that there does have to be a priest who is ordained um, by a bishop. There needs to be unleavened bread. So we follow the Jewish tradition of bread being unleavened, as it would have been at Passover. That's why our hosts are like they are. When we do a, we'll do a, like a Seder meal at the end of, as we get closer to Easter, and we'll kind of like pita bread, but there's, you can actually buy the bread that Jews traditionally use at their Passover meals. Um, but it's unleavened because of the, the need to get out of, out of uh, Egypt for the Exodus. Grape wine, with a little water added into it. So can I use strawberry wine? I can't. Can I use cranberry wine? I can't. Can I use blackberry wine? I can't. Can I use apple wine? I can't. Can I use rhubarb wine? I can't. All you can use is grape wine. The church does have like other desired preferences. It's the first pressing of the grapes and whatever. Can it be red wine or white wine? It can. It doesn't. Either one is fine. Sometimes when people like go to a church and like the wine is a white wine, they're like, oh my gosh, like. Is that valid? Like, I thought it had to be red, so it was like Jesus' blood. It's like, no, it doesn't have to be uh, red to uh, symbolize Jesus' blood. However, I will say, if you're celebrating Mass with white wine, it is often confusing sometimes to know whether you're putting the water or the wine in the chalice. And the church actually has prescriptions of what happens if the priest goes through the Mass, and then when he receives from the chalice, he realizes that he's receiving a chalice of water with a drop of wine in it. He actually, at that moment, is able to say solely the words of, of, of consecration right at that moment and not have to like repeat the whole entire thing. He's able to like just consecrate the chalice at that point right there. Because the water with a drop of wine in it is not valid. Words of consecration, which, which, which is, this is my body and this is my blood poured out for you, uh, or this is the cup of my blood. So those words are necessary. You notice that as we get like farther down in the sacraments, there's, there's more things that make it more complicated. Go back to baptism. What do you need? A person who wasn't baptized, another human being who's willing to baptize, and three drops of water. When you get to the other sacraments, there's a lot more that, that can be problematic. Yeah? Do you get to choose what wine that you could I? Yes. Do I care that much? No. So I just use whatever like is cheapest. <laughs> That's not terrible. <laughs> there are companies, religious companies, that make church altar wine. And so our local area, the Diocese of Indianapolis, 
has vendors that we normally work with. Um, so I'll be honest with you, I don't even know the company that we use. I don't even like pay attention that much. I know like we used to use Easily's, but I don't know if that's true anymore. I don't know who we use. I can get into that for you if you want. No, thank you. So uh, we believe that it's a meal and a sacrifice. We believe that both of these things are happening at the same time at Mass. It is the Last Supper where Jesus says, this is my body given out for you, this is my blood poured out for you, because that's what happened here. And the reason why he gave us this was to have access to this. And when we do what we do, celebrate Mass, both of those are taking place all at the same time. So, how do we receive the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist? Well, in the state of grace, we gave the definition earlier of grace. What is grace? The life of God or God's life. So, we want to make sure that we have the life of God in us. Um, so, that would normally mean that we've gone to confession with reverence and prayer, <coughs> with an open heart, um, with the recognition that the priest is solely a mediator and uh, that it's not about the priest, but that the, the Eucharist is actually God himself being given to us uh, through the hands of a priest. I guess it is have that in review. That's why that's on there. Okay. So that's where we're going to stop with segments of initiation tonight. Questions about anything we talked about? Is this like a good brief overview? Yes. Um, what, it, what about the case like if the priest or a, a person distributing communion were an alcoholic and would really not want to partake in the wine? Can you have a non alcoholic wine? So if I am an alcoholic, and I am a lay person, I would just not receive from the chalice. Because you're not required to receive from the chalice. Right, right. You don't have to. And we'll get, but like, so the smallest fragment of a host is Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity. The smallest drop from the chalice is Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity. One can receive from the chalice and from the, receive the host and the chalice. In a certain sense, it's receiving Jesus twice, because you can't separate Jesus. I can't say, like, well, here's Jesus' blood and here's Jesus' body. If you have that, you have actually have death. The separation of, of blood from body is, is death. This is why people who are, like, gluten-free or have wheat allergies, they can always receive from the chalice, and they have no, no, there, there are no problems. So there are some people who don't receive the host, they receive the chalice. There's many people who receive the host but don't receive from the chalice. If a priest is an alcoholic, there is this, I, keep, I think it's called mustin. There is this very, very, very low alcohol content, but it does have a, a certain level of alcoholic content that the priest is allowed to use. You'll often see priests in those situations that they will have a chalice for themselves that is not used by the lay faithful. Because whatever, I think it's called mustin. I think is what it's called. That they they they, they normally consecrate nor, normal alcohol content wine for the people. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Yes. So, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, the Eastern Orthodox Church does not use unleavened bread. You are very good. Yeah, they receive they they, they use leavened bread. Yes. And. Does, does Rome consider their Mass, their Eucharist, to be a true Eucharist? We acknowledge that it is valid. I'm pretty sure that we do. The reason why they, and I, I know the feel that the reason why they use leavened bread is they're focusing on the resurrection of Christ in the midst of the sacrifice. Um, I would, I would have to get back to you on the validity on that. But it's actually in wine too. I mean, they, but they, they use a, a spoon. yeah, yeah, yeah. Have, we, we, yeah, we, we acknowledge it as being, uh, <coughs> yeah, because like when you go, you, you can receive, yeah, 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 and Jeff receives, a yeah, 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 it's valid. Okay. Yeah. So, so when you said 
that unleavened bread was necessary. In, in, sorry, in, in the Latin rite, yes. In the, in the Roman Catholic Latin rite, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I can't consecrate leavened bread. How's that? There you go. God can do many more things than me. Thanks be to God. Yeah. No. <laughs> Uh, a few slides ago you had uh, Acts 2, Acts 20, and, Acts, uh, and another verse from Acts 20. <clears throat> were, those all, were those all full masses, or were they just examples of Eucharist? So, from what we know from just biblical sources, like the word breaking of the bread was what was used in the early church for the celebration of Mass. So, those are solely just opportunities where we see the breaking of the bread. Do we know for a fact that those were masses? No. But, that in the early church they're making reference to the breaking of the bread. And, from what we can tell from the biblical narrative and from the tradition, that phrase was being used for the celebration of Mass. The earliest celebrations of the Eucharist. Okay. Uh, so, like the first verse you mentioned, that the, they went to the temple for the liturgy and the breaking of bread in their homes for the Eucharist, and the, I guess combined, that's the celebration of Mass. So, and we'll look at this text later, There's a, it, it's a phenomenal text uh, called the Didache, but it's the earliest written transcript that we have of the celebration of Holy Mass, and um, it's from like the year 100. And it literally goes through and says what happens at Mass, and it's the same structure we use today. There's a singing of hymns, there's a confession of, of, sin, of sins, there's readings from the Old Testament, readings from the New Testament, a homily, the bringing forth of the bread and the wine, the Eucharistic prayer, the reception of Holy Communion, hosts from that Mass being brought out to the sick. So when we look at historically what was taking place, it's believed that just from Christian liturgical history that what's happening here is we, is we have the early church before they get expelled from, from the temple and the, well, the temple being torn down in 70 AD that this is where the formation of the mass came from was from them going to the temple and then going to their homes so that, but then um, I guess what I'm trying to get at is in Acts 27 and Acts 2011 um, are, you, are you understanding that to be a full mass with all of those parts I, or just the... I'm not making that statement. I'm, I, I'm going more off just the, the, the fact that the breaking of the bread became the, the, common, the common norm for the, what Christians were doing when they gathered for the celebration of mass. The, that, the, 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 the tradition would say that the breaking of bread was looked at as how they... the earliest celebrations of mass. Or the Eucharist. Yeah. Yes? So in other Christian denominations, there's no problem with people receiving communion. They welcome Catholics, even though we don't really participate. Um, but when you come to Catholic Church, you're not receiving communion. Can you explain why that is? I know some people feel it's very unwelcoming. About it is very... <laughs> no, it is very unwelcoming. It's terribly unwelcoming. Uh, and that's not the desire. But So... When we talk about communion, we would look at the sense of communion as being different. So first, our belief that Jesus Christ is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, in the Eucharist, is something that we believe that people should, should, should believe before they receive, so that they receive it with reverence. I'm not just receiving this just because... It's just a piece of bread. But because it is Jesus' Bible, it's holy divinity, we believe that the person should have some sort of catechesis, some sort of teaching, some sort of knowledge about what they are receiving. But number two, and being the proper state to receive it, which is the gone to confession, uh, but number two, communion is not just a, a horizontal communion, communion is also a... a Ver is this, no, not just a vertical communion, it's also a horizontal communion. And so when we talk about being in communion, we talk about also being in communion, not just in the fact that we both receive <coughs> the 
Jesus' body and blood, but we also that we theologically believe the same things. And that's where, if there's not a common confession of faith, that we would say that, well, we, don't, we aren't really in communion with each other when it comes to the faith. We believe very different things about the faith. And so the tradition has been, uh, unless we believe the same things, that we would not just give communion to those who do not believe. And that's actually in the document from the 100, the Didache, uh, from the, early, the earliest celebration that we have of the, of the early Christians, was that those who did not believe were not to receive. Um, and those who had not confessed were not to receive. So just this uh, understanding that there is a vertical and a horizontal communion that are both taking place at the same time. It's never because we're holier than them, but that's how it's often been. <coughs> that's not what it is, uh, because many of us are very bad sinners. Uh, and many people, yeah. But it has more to do with a theological understanding than a practical understanding. Yeah, excellent question. Yes. Are Eastern Orthodox the ones to receive our? They are, but they often don't. We we would be more ready to receive communion at their churches, but they often do not receive it from us. But yes, there is a because we are united. Any other questions? Real quick, just because this is a topic that came up today, I received an email from a parishioner who was very concerned. Um, so, she was out with a friend for lunch who said that, maybe they were talking about a friend of theirs from high school or something, and anyway, <clears throat> the topic of, of married priests came up. So, real quick, as Roman Catholics are custom and it is a custom, is that priests are celibate, which means that we're not married. Um, but however, this is a practice of the church. It is no way a divine command. Now, we can find in Matthew chapter 19, verses about the, that Christ says that some are called to remain unmarried for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the church tries to fulfill this through the life of celibacy in her priests and in religious sisters and religious brothers, that there is a role for people who are unmarried uh, within the church. So the practice of celibacy uh, is an ancient custom within the church, but it is not something that is absolutely necessary for one to be ordained a priest. So there are situations where there are men who are, who are married who are able to become ordained a priest. It's never the case that a celibate priest can get married. But it is possible for a married man to be ordained a priest. So, for example, and this is the example that, was, that happened today. There was a Lutheran minister who had been ordained a Lutheran pastor and served for several years in a... Uh, at a Lutheran church, and through his own study, he came to understand uh, the teachings of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, and he left his ministry and his whole livelihood as a pastor, and um, converted to Roman Catholicism, and then because of that, the church recognize that, okay, here's a man who had a calling, he was married, he now converted to Roman Catholicism, and this man still felt called to serve in the church, and so he was able to be ordained as a married man. There is actually a whole TV show, an audio show on, if you've ever heard of EWTN, which is called the Eternal Word Television Network, the Eternal Word Eternal World Television Network, which is Catholic TV. There's a whole TV show called, uh, oh my gosh, it just went blank on me. Jackie, do you have the name of it? I, I thought you were referring to Scott Hahn, but he did not. He Scott Hahn, the, he's, the, he's the pastor, but there, there's a, is it the Coming Home Network? The Coming Home, there's a whole show all about Protestant pastors who come to the Catholic Church. Many of them get ordained priests, 
Actually, I should say more, more than not, they don't. But some do become ordained. Um, and so they are... Uh, it, that, that is a possibility. There is a priest in this who served a lot in this area, for those of you who are a little older, uh, Father Burwinkle. He was a priest. Did he marry you? Yeah. Did you? We have to talk some <laughs> um, But he was, he was married, had a whole bunch of children, and his, his wife died. And so he was a widower, and he became a priest. Um, yeah, so anyways, there are, like, with all things, there's, like, the church is not always as black as white as it makes it out to be. Like the church is very understanding, and compassionate, and full of ways to try to open doors and make things happen. So, anyways, uh, I have a priest friend of mine right now who he just brought a Lutheran pastor, totally unrelated to this story. A Lutheran pastor and his wife just joined his church, um, and this Lutheran pastor is interested in the possibility of coming. So it's actually on the desk of our archbishop right now of whether the archbishop has to actually approve. And anyways, yeah. So, but there's so many Anglicans that are joining the, joining the church right now that actually Pope Benedict actually started what's called the Anglican Ordinariate, which is um, Anglican priests can be ordained and become. It's like it's like a I don't even know how to explain it, but it's like a subgroup of Catholics. But they are full-fledged Roman Catholics, uh, but they, the Episcopalian Church and the Anglican Church are struggling very much so right now. Uh, and many, of, many are really in very large numbers are returning to the Catholic Church. Um, and so we are accept, we're, we're welcoming them, and also many of their ministers are being ordained. So, yes? So the priests that are coming in, are they like currently married, like they are run, like head of like running a church and a family at the same time? Okay. So, and what's hard for them, very, very hard for them, is that by them converting to Catholicism, they are literally giving up occupation, reputation, relationships, everything. So it's very, very hard. Yeah. But, they're following the Lord in their heart. Um, next week, I will be on a silent retreat, so little facts for all of you. Uh, I'm required as by church law to go on a five-day retreat every year. Uh, I do two of them because I just like to get away from all of you. Uh, actually, I do two of them because I have found, uh, just for my own self and my own sanity, and for some of you who might know me a little bit, I work sometimes a little too much, and it's just it's the best thing for me. So I do two weeks. Uh, well, they're five days, Monday through Friday, of a silent retreat. And so I'll be gone next week on retreat, and then I do another one. And the one that I do this week is just by myself. And then I do one in January, February, which is with, like, there's like 40 of us priests. And it's a priest retreat, so there's like a retreat director who gives talks. We are in silence the whole time. It's totally cool. Um, and so anyways, I will be gone. Uh, next week, uh, my mother will actually be teaching class next week, so please be nice to her. <laughs> and don't, like, make fun of her. <laughs> Throw spitballs or <laughs> pass notes. <laughs> um, any questions? All right, let's bow our heads and ask the Lord's blessing upon us today. Heavenly Father, I ask your grace and blessing upon those who are gathered here this evening. Draw us closer and closer to your truth. Help us to know your will and to believe it and to follow it in all ways. We ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Bless everyone present tonight, and the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here.